All right, so continuing the theme of transportation transformation, um, I want to bring up um, Dan Irwin from um, Crossrail in uh, London. So our next two speakers um, are going to continue the British accent uh, theme. <laughs> um, and uh, this, is, this is truly an amazing story about how building infrastructure can, can change the, the future. So no more stealing Dan's thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right, um, I'd like you all to sit back, relax, but not too much, and enjoy the story of Crossrail. So what is Crossrail? Um, in essence, it's a new railway for London and the southeast of England. Uh, it was commissioned in 2008 at a budget of 20 billion US dollars and stretches from uh, Reading out in the west through central London and out to uh, Essex in the east. There'll be about 150 kilometres of track, 42 kilometres of which are board tunnel through centre of London and around 40 stations, 10 of which are new. There is estimated to be around 200 million passenger journeys per year on this route. That's the equivalent of around 10% of the total rail carrying capacity of London at present. So it's a massive increase. The trains themselves will be 200 metres long. The platforms, as you can see here, will be about 250 metres long. It's equivalent of around about two so soccer pitches. So extremely long platforms. Each train will be able to carry 1,500 passengers. And at peak, there will be 24 trains per hour running through the central operating section with around 12 on the outskirts. And we've designed it with an operational lifetime of around about 120 years, so what we're building now is going to last. So it's an extremely complex uh, environment that we have to work in. Uh, this is the contractual arrangement we have. We essentially manage a number of contracts and projects to deliver this. We have our, um, our uh, design contracts in the middle, uh, enabling works and, and then construction delivery contracts on the right. But we also need to be extremely accurate. British National Grid is the standard coordinate system that we use in the UK, but for Crossrail's purposes it's not good enough. Um, so between us and London Underground, who also operate a lot of the underground system within uh, London, we developed a new coordinate system called London Survey Grid. Typically, with British National Grid, you would see a distortion in linear features over a kilometre of plus or minus 200 mil. That wasn't good enough for us. So with London Survey Grid, we've got that down to about plus or minus 5 mil. And this can be exemplified in this example here. So this is Tottenham Court Road Station, where the tunnel boring machines were passing through a couple of years ago. The yellow you can see in the middle is the tunnel boring machine. The rest of it is Tottenham Court Road Station and its surrounds. They called it threading the eye of the needle because they had to pass a tunnel boring machine weighing several thousand tons and 120 metres long through that gap. And when I say through that gap, I mean they had a tolerance of half a metre between the pilings above it and the tunnel boring machine itself. Only 80 centimetres between the tunnel boring machine and the uh, subway below. So confident were they that this was all planned and accurate that they didn't even close the station as this thing passed through. And trust me, if this had gone wrong, it would have been a catastrophe. So we're creating two railways, in essence, with Crossrail. We're creating a physical railway, as you can see on the left. This is Canary Wharf Station, the oversight development that's already been built. And we're also creating a digital railway, which you can see on the right. And this consists of a number of things. We have around 2 million CAD drawings and models being produced, which will be handed over at the end of the project. Around about 8 million supporting documents. We're bringing around about a million assets into operation uh, at the end. And we have about 50 million GIS features in the system at present. In total, about 12 terabytes of data is going to be handed over at the end of this project. Now, there's some arrows there dictating the flow of information there. That's not strictly true. Um, the data systems all talk to one another. The GIS in particular talks back to the document management systems. It talks back to CAD systems. It talks to a whole host of different systems. So what do we have? We have a spatial database at our core, and that really is the backbone of this. And that talks to a number of different other information systems within Crossrail, around 10 to 12 other information systems. We try to do that in real time. We try to have live links. It's not always possible. So in some cases, we'll use spatial ETL tools to generate the information to get from uh, A to B. And then we publish this out 
through a, a portal for ArcGIS instance we call CrossRail Maps. I'll come back to that in a minute. What we also do is we publish out to the public. We have a, a, a site called Near You, which is a literal site map that allows users, anyone in the world, it's a, a, main, a public website, to be able to go in and have a look at what's going on on the, on the project. So they can have a look at the stations, the tunnel boring machines, they can have a look at the archaeology that's being carried out along the routes. And we also push data out onto mobile, onto Explorer and Collector apps for ArcGIS, which allows the users to be able to see exactly what they would see in the office out on site. And we have about 30 sites across the route. So the main one really is Crossrail Maps. This is our portal. Um, there's a little video I'm going to run through. It's only going to touch the surface, really. The idea is it's open, so anybody on the project can get into this. They don't need to um, have special access. And they can immediately jump in and start visualising. We're here at Farringdon Station now, and immediately we're looking at all sorts of other different information sources. Here is our list of all of our assets for the facility that we're building. We can go back and we can have a look at the documents for that facility. So we're using the map as a way into those other data sets. Uh, I'm going to open up a random document now. Uh, just to show you, so we can quite easily jump into that information. Buried away originally in, in those other systems are sometimes quite difficult to get into, but this just makes it so much easier. We can also look at our as-builds, so we can look at our as-built drawings to see what information about that uh, facility has already been created. And again, we can have a look at a sample drawing there. So there's a whole host of information sitting in, in just one feature, in just one layer of that map. What I'm going to do now is just log in as me, uh, which will give me access to some information. Now, about 90% of the information is open to everybody on the project. Around 10% of it is locked away for various reasons around security, licensing restrictions. We've got some new apps now. I'm going to jump into the Utilities app. So there's some terms and conditions around its use because of the licensing. And I'm going to jump now over to Paddington Station, one of the stations in the far west of the route. And what this immediately shows us is the utilities data for that location. We can start to interact with that. If there's information not available in the app, we can add it. So we're going to add in now spaces or floor plans uh, for Paddington Station. I've only added in the first floor because obviously there's about 10 floors to the station and in 2D that can get a bit messy. But again, we can start immediately interacting and jumping off to our asset information system to try and find the information that we're after. I'm going to touch on one more layer now which is called BIAD, which is our Building Infrastructure Asset Database. Essentially, it's third-party buildings and structures that were um, uh, at risk, essentially, uh, when we were building the routes. Uh, there are around about two to 300 layers in the system, so I'm not going to go through every single one for you, unfortunately. Um, but just to show you that we have that sort of information to hand that anybody can get to. So we can see Paddington Station, and actually we can see the Bakerloo Line ticket hall directly below it. But that was in 2D. What we also wanted to do was build it in 3D. We realise that we're building a three-dimensional infrastructure. All of our modelling that goes on is done in three dimensions. So what we've done is we've taken a lot of that 2D information and we've ported it into the 3D world. So those utilities that you saw earlier, this is a custom house station, which is another station, we can now see in the th true three-dimensional context. And the same goes for the floor plans. We can actually visualise those in their environment, in their context, in terms of where they are on the station. And from those, we can generate points of interest. So we can immediately start to figure out where our entrances and our exits and our escalators uh, and our lifts uh, and other features that may be of use are. We've also taken multiple versions of the design. So as we've seen it progress through time, you can see here on the right is the design, the original design, and the left is the actual construction. And you can check the stairwell on the left-hand side. That changed significantly during that process. And a very easy way to uh, quickly understand and visualize that. But the main thing for me is the search capability here. There's a lot you can't see. So if I said, let there be light, we can now see all of the lights within that facility quite easily by doing a simple search. And I've not sped this up. This is, this is real time. This is how quick it works. Or I can look for doors. Anything that's got the attribution around it, we can search for. I can be slightly less granular. So just show me mechanical components within there. And it will find them. And you can see them there. Or we can search for electrical components. And we'll see the electrical components appear. That includes the lights that we were looking for earlier, because essentially they're a subset of electrical systems. What it doesn't show is some of the more fine wiring that you typically see. Obviously, they're mainly available through schematics. 
And again, we can link off to that and actually go and vi visualize the, the information about that asset. So some of the benefits that we've seen at Crossrail with the work that we've done so far, the main one really is simplicity. It's, it's giving someone, the user, a map, which is a very intuitive, a very communicative way of getting at the information they're after and simplifying it in a way that they can use it. I've used the London Underground map here, the Harry Beck map, uh, as an example of taking what is a very complex geographic set of rules and entities and simplifying them into something that can be easily consumed. There's also an operation around interoperability. There's a benefit there. If we weren't able to connect all of those data sources in the background, then a lot of what we do, a lot of what you just saw, wouldn't be possible. Indeed, um, we have some documentation in the UK, some standards around BIM called PAS 1192, and they specifically require the use of what they call a federated information model. That's essentially what we're doing. We have a series of different disparate databases that are all connected to survive one purpose through the GIS. And it's an accessible system. So multiple different users, be they engineers or operators, um, can access the same tool, the same place, without having to route around through endless amounts of um, other systems. Some specific returns on investment that we've seen during the course of this project. The first one is around tunnel boring. We saw the example at Tottenham Court Road earlier. Um, when we did this, we decided to actually combine the way that CAD and GIS worked. So actually, the information was being created in one place, but serving two different purposes. And by using a series of geoprocessing tasks and rules around that, we managed to save somewhere in the region of 5,000 person hours per year. Our land and property team have been extremely busy on Crossrail. We, they've worked from the beginning to acquire land that we needed to work on, to manage that land going forward, and to ultimately hand it over. And the use of the GIS system has saved them about 75% of the time that they would normally spend on some of these activities. And that's equated to about $115,000 per year savings. And lastly, our asset protection engineers, who typically had to complete a claims uh, report, uh, would have to go to five or six different separate databases and systems to merge all that together. We're taking them up to two days. What we did was we automated all that for them, where they simply click on a building within the map, it generates that report in the back end, and it's taken it down from somewhere in the region of two days to less than half a day. And that's, again, saved about $150,000. But we've learned some lessons along the way. Don't expect you to be able to read all of this. Um, this is the business landscape for RFL, who essentially Rail for London is going to operate the, uh, the, the railway once it goes live. Um, what I wanted to highlight, these are all of the uh, parts of that business process that either implicitly or explicitly use location. There's quite a lot of it going on through there. Uh, and we've learned a lot of this on the way, that how important that location information is going to be for them when it comes to running the, running the railway. Second lessons learned is around IT strategy. Now, Crossrail, as I said, was commissioned in 2008. That was two years before the iPad came out. Things have changed a lot in all those years. Unfortunately, the IT strategies that we've had in place haven't really kept up with that. The hardware that we use now is still from 2010. There's no way I'm running ArcGIS Pro, unfortunately. That needs to change with IT strategies going forward for future projects. The same goes for infrastructure. We use a typical server client uh, architecture within Crossrail. Unfortunately, again, that doesn't really lend us towards use of cloud networks. We looked at using ArcGIS Online when we signed up with Esri some three or four years ago. Um, unfortunately, the way that the infrastructure is set up within Crossrail doesn't really allow us to do that. So again, for future projects, the use of cloud, I think, is going to be a way to save money, save time, and be more flexible. And then the last one is around security. Unfortunately, security is a necessity, but it's a double-edged sword. Um, when we first signed up, we were three months before we could access any Esri base maps because our servers wouldn't allow us to talk out to the internet. So again, it's just making that security more flexible arrangement for the end user and for us as GIS persons. And lastly, for 3D, you know, we've seen 3D come on a long way very recently. And this should be a video that plays. Come on, are we going to work? No. OK. Um, essentially, we've seen 3D come on a long way since we started. Um, it's only going to go in one direction. 
Uh, what we're now seeing here, as it's working, um, is uh, we built a 3D routing network around the station that allows the engineers to basically figure out where it is they need to go and do a virtual walkthrough of that station without even leaving the office. And ultimately, what we want to see is taking those big maps and putting them on small devices. Here is an example uh, that we, we did for, it's not going to work. <laughs> um, here's an example we did uh, for, um, I'll just show you, uh, for a prototype of a, an app that a third party developed that essentially took the GIS data, the CAD data, and gamified it, put it onto an app that everybody could access. So just some of the wider Crossrail benefits to round up. Um, essentially, we were looking at uh, developing uh, or helping to develop 57,000 new homes along the route. Indeed, more than half of the planning applications that have come in within 500 meters of the route cite Crossrail as a specific reason to build. We've generated somewhere in the region of 5 million square feet of space, development space, that we're actually we're going to sell back to uh, developers and to, to property owners, um, which will, should claw back about 500 million pounds. Journey times are obviously going to reduce. It's a major factor. At the moment, to go from Heathrow to Liverpool Street takes around about 50 to 55 minutes. That's going down to about 32 minutes. So it's great for consumers, it's great for commuters, it's great for tourists, it's great for the economy. In total, the estimated sort of wider economic benefit to the UK throughout this project has been to, say, to come up with about $42 billion. That works out about 2.76 on the benefit-cost ratio. So for every dollar we're putting in, we're getting $2.76 back. So what I'd like to do now is uh, finish up, because apparently that video won't work either, um, was to welcome you to the Elizabeth Line which will be the name of the operating railway once it opens in 2018. Thanks. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. You know, the thing that really impressed me um, when I got the chance to go to the UK in, in May and um, meet the team and what, what Dan's doing is the incredibly small number of people doing this. I mean, in many ways, um, Dan is the chief cook and bottle washer for, for this project. And it's a testament to the sort of vision that's part of, that's part of this. Um, but in terms of these numbers, I mean, this is an incredible um, return. Mm. And, and we talked, you talked a little bit about the documents. You know, just go through the size of the project again in terms of the number of documents and things. Um, so there's, yeah, like, so there's around, there's two, around two million CAD drawings and models that will be handed over. There's an awful lot that essentially is, is just part of the project that won't. There's about 10 million in total at the moment. Um, the same goes for the, the documents that we've got in our document management system. There's around about 8 million that will be handed over. So it's a huge volume of information that we need to pass across. And we need to do it in a, in a structured way. We need to do it in a way that is consistent with what the operator needs to actually run the business. Yeah, so, so the, you're building a system that essentially you're handing over to somebody who's going to inherit it. So you're not yeah. even continuing t on this project. And in mm. fact, um, come when? Are you looking for a job? Um, about this time next year. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if anybody wants a really experienced GS person um, that's done an incredible thing, um, Dan's out for a, for a job. But I'm <laughs> sure he won't actually need to be looking one. So thank you.